Hello everyone, I am Bob and this is the Home Bitcoin Immersion Mining Channel. Today in this build series episode, we're going to cover the build of my miner control system. So let's get started. Now before getting into my build, a few disclaimers. I am not a qualified, licensed, or certified electrician, plumber, or HVAC technician. I have zero qualifications to make any additions, modifications, or updates to any type of home infrastructure. And so treat everything presented here as entertainment. I'm here to show you what I'm doing in my house, figuring things out as I go, likely making a lot of mistakes along the way. So before you do anything to your house, seek a professional who has the appropriate experience, skills, licensing, and or certification needed to do that type of specific work on your house. And as always, any work in your house should follow all local, regional, and national building codes and permitting standards. And so with that out of the way, let's get on with the episode. Okay, so in the last episode, we covered the basics of Home Bitcoin Emerging Mining control systems. We need a system with some type of fluid temperature sensor, some type of fluid flow sensor, power control devices to control the power to the miners and the pump, and some sort of logic device to make everything work together. And as we covered in the last episode, the first decision to make is to choose which technology to use in that logic control device. Now, the first option to look at are programmable logic controllers. Now, for my system, this really wasn't an option because, to be honest, I really don't have any experience with that technology and I didn't want to take that on as part of this build. Maybe I'll look at that as an option in future episodes. Um, you know, leave a comment below if you're interested. Now the next options to look at are a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino. Um, I do have coding experience and I've played with Raspberry Pis in the past, so that was an option for my build. But I thought about the long-term upkeep of a computer running code and I really wanted something that I could design and build once and then have it just work for years without needing any upgrade or maintenance. So with those options ruled out, this left me with a relay circuit, and that's what I decided to use. Because for me, I'm really comfortable with wiring and soldering, and I've built relay-based control circuits before. And so it just seemed like the easiest and quickest way to get something up and running for my build. Now with that decision made to use a relay circuit, my choice for the type of temperature and flow sensors was pretty straightforward. And that's because when it comes to integrating sensors with a relay circuit, continuous output sensors really don't work that well without adding additional controllers to interpret those sensor outputs. And so a switch type sensors are the way to go here. For my temperature sensor, I use a company called Whitman Controls. Uh, they make a really cool thermal switch. Uh, it's stainless steel, so it'll be compatible with dielectric fluid, and it comes in both normally open and normally closed options, so I can choose the right option that will interface with my circuit. They make these in 25 degree temperature steps throughout the temperature range that miners operate at, and these are industrial sensors, so they should be very reliable and last a very long time. And last but not least, the price wasn't too bad either. Uh, I've put a link below if you're interested in using these type of sensors on your build. Now for my flow sensor, I didn't have as good of luck. Um, I really struggled to find an economic flow switch that had good flow rate, good material compatibility, and was an industrial grade sensor that would last. I did find one that would work. It is made by GEM Sensor. It is model FS-200. Its internal components should be compatible with my dielectric fluid. It is an industrial sensor, so it should be very reliable and last a long time, and it has a good flow rate, so it really shouldn't impede the minor fluid flow. However, it wasn't cheap at all, and so this is definitely a component that you might want to look around for a better idea in your setup. Now, the last part of my control system to figure out is what to use to control the power to my miners and my pump. Here, I went with a definite purpose contractor relay instead of a PDU. And the reason why is I looked at a lot of different vendors for PDUs and then looked at what it would take to integrate a PDU into my logic circuit. And it really seemed to make more sense to directly wire a relay into the logic circuit instead of trying to interface the circuit with some sort of PDU. Also, it seemed like I could buy a couple relays for one to two miners a little cheaper than getting into a PDU. Now, I got my definite purpose contractor relays from a company called C3 Controls. Uh, the prices were pretty reasonable, and they have a wide range of different models to choose from. Um, I use their Series 280 relays, and I have a link below if you'd like to use something similar in your build. 
Now, in the last episode, I kind of made a big deal about safely wiring your miner to your power source. Um, I'm not an electrician and I'm not an electrical engineer, but here is how I'm wiring each of my miners to each of my power relays. I've got a breaker in each line out, and this should protect my cables and miners in the event of an unexpected short. Now for my pump relay, I just use a simple power relay. Uh, it's model AZ2800 made by American Zettler. There's a link below if you want to use this as well. Hey folks, just a quick reminder to hit that like button so the YouTube algorithm will share all this good content with other people and for you to hit the subscribe button so you won't miss any good content coming your way. With that, back to the episode. Okay, so with all the components figured out, the next step is the relay circuit itself. Now again, I'm not an electrical engineer, so forgive me if I don't have this drawn up quite right, but here is the basic version of my relay circuit. It's a 24 volt DC circuit, and it has two main control relays, one for fluid temperature and one for fluid flow. Now each of these are latching type relays, and the way latching relays work is that when you power one side of the relay, the relay will switch to that side. The relay will then stay latched in that position even if power is interrupted. The only way for the switch to be reversed is if power is applied to the opposite side of the relay to switch it back. Now the reason why I chose latching relays is because if something goes wrong, I don't want the miners or pump to turn on and off and on again repeatedly if there's an intermittent problem. I want the system to turn off and then stay off until I can step in and figure out what's not working. I have a link below to the specific relay I used if you're interested in using the same type of relay in your system. Moving on, the outputs of my control circuit activate my three power relays, one for each miner and one for the pump. Next, I've got both my temperature and flow switches configured to be open when temperature and flow are okay, and to close when there is a problem. So, the way this works is that when everything is going well, the temperature and flow switches stay open, and the temperature and flow control relays stay closed. This sends 24 volts to the miner and pump power relays, keeping them closed, which then keeps power flowing to the miners and the pump. However, if the temperature in the mining cooling fluid gets too hot, the temperature switch will trigger and close its part of the circuit. That will activate the temperature control relay, which then will stop power from being delivered to the miner relays. This will cut power to the miners, turning them off and keeping them from being damaged from a hot cooling fluid. However, if you look at how this circuit works, the pump will continue to get power circulating fluid, hopefully cooling the miners back down. Now likewise, if the fluid flow gets interrupted, the fluid flow switch will close its part of the circuit. That in turn will trigger the fluid control relay, which then will stop power from being sent to both the pump and miner relays. This will interrupt the power being sent to both the miner and the pump, shutting them down. This in turn will prevent the miners from overheating and prevent the pump from being damaged. Now with the basic circuit being figured out, I added a little more to make the circuit a little more usable. First, I had to add some switches. These are simple push button switches that will only close when you hold them down. And these will allow me to reset the latching relays after I fix whatever has gone wrong. But more importantly, these are actually needed to start up the system. Cause when you think about it, before the system starts up, the fluid isn't flowing. And of course, that means the flow switch is gonna be telling the system that there's a problem and won't let any power flow to the pump to start up. So with this circuit design, a manual push button switch will override the flow switch until the pump is up and running and the flu is flowing enough to get the fluid flow switch to sense a positive fluid flow and then signal that everything is okay. Now, with the basic operation covered, I then added a few extras. Uh, first, I added some manual switches to the inputs to both the minor power and pump power relays. These aren't essential, but these will let me turn off the miners or pump if I wanna shut parts of the system down deliberately, or if I wanna shut down and restart one of the miners from outside of the tank. Second, I also added some LED lights. 
Now, these are really not essential, but I figured they look pretty cool, and these also will let me know the current status of the system. There's an LED indicating the 24 volt system power is running, and there's LEDs for both the latching relays, indicating if there's a problem with the fluid temperature or fluid flow. And finally, there's LEDs for each of the minor relays, indicating if power is being sent to the pump or the miners. So that's the design of my control system. With that covered, let's go to my mining room and see how it turned out. So here's the finished product. Uh, as you can see, I put my control system into an equipment cabinet. Um, these equipment cabinets are available online. Um, I have a link below to the one I chose. Uh, I evaluated several different types and I really like this one. Uh, it's fiberglass, it's got a nice seal on it. And the inside came with a metal back plate and a bunch of DIN rails. So it was really easy to integrate my system into the box. And as you can see, when it comes to the push buttons and the LEDs and the switches, um, I chose to use industrial grade hardware. Um, really, that is super overkill for something like this. Uh, you can get by with a lot cheaper material. Um, I chose them because honestly, I just think they look cool. I wanted to splurge a little here. But for your setup, you probably can get away with something much lower grade because you're really not going to be using this many times a day for the next how many years. You also notice a couple detectors midway down. Um, these are not in my control circuit diagram. Uh, I bought these later, I uh, found them. They were really cheap on Amazon. Um, I got a link below if you wanna get something similar. Uh, they're really simple power meters that will measure how much power is going to each miner when I turn them on. Now, before I power this up and show you how everything works, uh, I'm gonna open this up so we can look at inside and see kind of the detailed build of how everything came together. Okay, so with the door open, you can see the complexity of what it takes to put something like this together. Uh, walking through the individual components here, uh, I have a Meanwell power supply, 24 volts driving the whole thing. Uh, Meanwell makes a lot of really good DC power supplies. I have a link below for this one, but there's a lot of different models out there for bigger or smaller systems. Uh, right next to that, I have the low voltage relays, the latching relays for both temperature and flow. And then below that, we have the definite purpose contactor relays and the pump relay. And then below that, I have all of the breakers, which again, protect my system in case there's a short in the miner. Now going below further, we have my cables going out to my miner. Now, as we talked about in the last episode, it's really important to get cables that are compatible with your dielectric fluid. Otherwise, the cables will fall apart over time, short out, and create lots of problems for you. Now, when it comes to finding cables that are compatible with Bitcoin mining, uh, when I looked a while back, I really didn't find any good options that would sell a one or two miner setup. Uh, most vendors out there who make miner cables uh, were selling for very large quantities towards industrial miners. Now, this space is changing quite fast. Um, I haven't looked recently, but I imagine if there isn't a vendor now, there will be a vendor very quickly out there uh, who will sell a one or two minor setup when it comes to cabling. However, if you do want to make your own cables like I did, uh, a vendor that I've used for this and many other home electric projects is Wire and Cable Your Way. Uh, they have pretty much any wire and cable you can think of. Uh, they'll sell it to you by the foot. I've had really good experiences with them. So again, if you're looking to build your own cable, that might be a company to look into. So with all the components covered, the next thing to talk about is kind of the complexity of something like this. Uh, as I mentioned before, I've done this before. I'm really comfortable with wiring. This is not a big deal for me. But if you're someone who has worked on a car before or maybe a house project, and wiring like this just scares the heck out of you, uh, maybe this isn't the right approach. Maybe the PLC or Raspberry Pi might be better for you. In those other options, instead of a ton of wiring, you're gonna be writing code. And so when you think about it, you're trading wiring complexity for possible code complexity. So no matter what you do here, there is gonna be some work and you're gonna to have to figure this out to make everything come together. And even if you do use one of those other options that is more code based, you are going to have to do a little wiring. You're going to have to connect your flow and temperature sensor to the device. You're also going to have to work all the high power electronics. Uh, that's just not going to be done uh, through the code base. Now, when it comes to my specific design, 
Honestly, this is a lot more complicated than it needed to be. Um, if I would do this again, I would not have mounted the relays inside the box when it comes to those latching low voltage relays. I would have put them on the door where all the LEDs and all the switches and everything else is. A lot of this wiring is just there because I have to move the signals back and forth between the door and the box. Uh, another thing that I would have done differently or better if I had to do this again has to do with the tightness of everything on this board. Um, everything's kind of on top of each other. I have a lot of wires that are doubled over on each other. And if I were to do this again, uh, again, moving those relays onto the door would have given me more room to space things out. Uh, the other option would be to use two boxes. Uh, one box for the high current, high power circuitry, the other box for the low voltage control circuitry. Uh, dividing those two up would have definitely given me more room to work with and not have everything so cramped into place. Now, before I turn the system on, one more safety topic. Um, if you looked at the circuit design and look at the device here, there's no main power cutoff. Um, that's actually a big deal. Um, all these systems are experimental. No one's really done these before. I'm building mine for the first time. You're going to be building yours for the first time. And you know, if something goes wrong, you want to be able to cut all the power very quickly. You don't have to run through your house uh, to find your breaker box and hit the switch there. And the reason why you don't see a power cutoff right here on the box or in my circuit design is because right out of camera view on that wall is my local load center. Um, as you can see in this picture, uh, everything is very clearly marked. It's within arm's length, so if anything goes wrong, I literally can reach over and shut off everything. So again, another thing to think about when you design your system, you are going to want some way of cutting off all the power very quickly and very close by. So next step is to turn this on and show you how it works. Uh, from the camera distance, it's really hard to see what's going on. So I'm going to step behind the camera and show you in detail uh, how I turn everything on and how it works. Okay, so starting with all power off, I'm going to turn on the breaker, which feeds both the 24 volt supply and the pump. It takes a couple seconds for the power supply to come online, but as soon as it is up and running, you can see the green LED indicating the power supply is running. Now looking at the other LEDs, both minor and pump LEDs are off. This makes sense since all three switches are off and no power can be sent to either the miners or the pump. You also see the LEDs for the temperature and flow sensors are on as well. The temperature sensor is green because the system has started up and is cold, which is good, but the flow sensor is red because the pump is off and so there's no flow, which is bad. Now to get the system up and running, first I have to turn the pump switch on. This will allow power to be sent to the pump relay. However, power can't currently get there because the flow sensor is still telling the system there is no fluid flow. So to get things running, I have to override the flow sensor and send power to the pump to get the fluid moving, and the reset startup button does just that. Holding it down for just a few seconds allows the pump to spin up and get the fluid moving enough for the flow sensor to go green. With both the temperature and flow sensors in the green, the next step is to reach over and turn the breakers on for both miners. You can see the power meters for both miners coming online, but power is still not being sent to either miner since both miner switches are off. Now, I don't have either miner currently attached, so we're not going to see any current flow, but I can turn on both miner switches, which energize all four cords going to the miners. Everything now is up and running, and if I had my miners attached, I'd be mining Bitcoin. Now, I can't show you what happens when the temperature switch goes red. Um, I really don't have an easy way of getting that sensor heated up in a controlled manner, but I can cause a flow interruption by simply just turning off the pump switch. As you can see, when the flow stops, the flow switch goes red, and the power is cut to both the miners and the pump, protecting them from damage. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Uh, my minor control system is built, connected, and running well. And so next time, we're going to cover designing dry coolers and other heat rejection systems. So with that, bye.